I'm still caught up in the hedge fund idea. So Steve Cohen, Ray Dalio, right? All these guys are okay. billionaires, right? So yeah, world's like, biggest art collections. So how did they get so rich if it doesn't work? Well, for a time, it was like the you know everyone thought, oh my God, they're so great. The hedge fund. So for many in the '90s and 2000s, like this, the word was really like this mystique that you had these really high performing hedge funds, and there were a few. There were there were a few people that actually can beat the market. Ray Dalio is one who's done it consistently. He's not taking your money. The average, you know, when they're really that good, they don't take an average investor's money. They train their own money in a few very, very large institutions. So those funds are not open to the average investor. But then all the other hedge funds, which kind of suck, right? They're bathing in the afterglow of the aura of the hedge fund manager we see like on billions, right? So you're just a like mystical hedge fund. Manager. Well, guess what? Most of these guys suck. All right, they they're not beating the S. They're just not. It's mad. It's historically proven. They don't beat the S and B, and they take these massive fees when they do win one year, and they always get that two percent magic. So watch what happens. Let's say you're managing a billion dollars. So b- before you even start, it's twenty million a year you're getting just in. But before the fund even starts, plus twenty percent of all the profits. And when you take those and how about this? I'll go one step further. And also, when you have a hedge fund, you have to show activity. Because unless you're, you can't just buy the S&P and hold it. Someone will say, well, why would I give you my money? You're not doing anything. So they almost have to show activity to justify their existence, which makes them engage in short-term trading. And pe- human beings are just terrible market timers. They, and this is just over, it's proven over 100 plus years of studies that you cannot trade in and out of, of the stock market, buying, selling, selling, buying sector, this sector one day. So it's just a trap. The way I look at it is this, so Wall Street, creates massive value. They do. Wall Street's necessary. You can hate Wall Street, despise them for what they things they do wrong, but Wall Street is necessary. They create massive value for the economy. They take companies public, right? They finance the growth of America. It's needed. They maintain the debt markets, the credit markets. That's the useful side of Wall Street, where they create massive value. Then there's the not so useful, the dark side of Wall Street, where they create bubble after bubble after bubble, where they have instruments of financial mass destruction they create for just gambling purposes, where they churn you, they have excess commissions and fees and rob the public blind. So the question right, in the book was, you know, how does the average person get the maximum exposure to the good side of Wall Street, which is the great companies they take public and finance that become huge multinationals? So how do you maximize that, but avoid the corruption? Well, the churning and the burning and the you know financial bubbles and so forth, try to and, and play into what I call the Wall Street fee machine complex, which is this advertising monolith where basically they convince you, like people like Kramer, to play the sucker's game. With actively, if you go on CNBC, they're all day long trying to convince people to play the short-term trading game, which is indeed a sucker's game. So you go into a casino, right? We spoke about uh, about Kerry Packer, right? Because gambling, yeah. right? So they own casinos, the Packer family, right? So in a casino, you you go in there knowing that the odds are against you by what five percent, depending on what game you play. So the odds are against you, and the house will win over time, right? That's a legit casino. The odds are against you. But what if you go into a corrupt casino where they have loaded dice and a dealing from the bottom of the deck? That's Wall Street. So now not only are the odds against you because you know it's hard to pick winning stocks, but there's people who have information that's more timely than you. They're trading ahead of you. They are charging excess fees. And also, you have all these publications and new chat and news, whether it's CNBC, Bloomberg isn't as bad, right? Because they cater mostly to professionals, but still trying to convince people that, you know, you could somehow figure out when you should buy oil and then sell your meta and then somehow go into a steel stock and then go into overseas. I mean, it's, it's insane. It doesn't work. And people get financially whipsawed. And I saw it myself, my own family member. Very successful guy. I start my book off telling his story. About your brother-in-law. Yeah, my brother-in-law. He's, he's a very smart guy. And he's. I watched his portfolio get decimated through short-term trading and using margin, all the things that they... Was he doing it himself? He was trying to do it himself and, you know, following tips he heard on TV or online. And, and it's just, it is so simple. And what happened to him? Well, he's, thankfully, he's successful. He lost a lot of money, and then he learned his lesson, and I showed him what to do the right way, and he now he's building a, a proper portfolio for the long term. So I think the distinction is this. You can get rich in the stock market, but not overnight. It's just, it's, it's, it doesn't work. You can't do that. And if you try to get rich by engaging in short-term trading or picking like one stock, you're probably going to end up in the financial poorhouse. 
So the solution I put in this book, which is ironic of where I came from, right? Because I committed fraud 30 years ago, right? Yeah. So I've, as you said, I've seen both sides, right? So the solution in the book is, is really very simple to build a world-class portfolio and secure your future. Because I don't think you can rely on social security these days. You don't have to pay for your diapers when you're in a nursing home by the time you get it, right? So this is about you know, empowering yourself financially and it's about doing less versus more, not hiring experts. Less trading yourself. Less trade. It's about investing as opposed to speculating. Now, there's nothing wrong with speculating. It's fun, right? And if you want to take 5% of your capital and speculate and buy and sell, and that's great. There's nothing wrong with that. Now, I encourage people to do that because it's good. You can have fun with that. And maybe you'll make some money. But that's not how you secure your retirement. If you want to secure a great retirement, you start off young as possible, right? And it's never too late, by the way. And it doesn't matter how much money you have. To st- you can start with a little bit of money. You don't need a lot. But the key is making little, small, regular contributions and not worrying. Just to an index fund? Is that what you're it, saying? It, well, um, the main one is an index fund. You want to have an index fund, S&P, low-cost S&P 500 index fund. And you want to have it in certain types of accounts that are tax-deferred whenever possible and so forth, right? Then you also want to balance that out with some, you need to have some bonds in there, a small amount, depending on your age, right? And on top of that, some cash for an emergency. And then if you want to speculate, you can have, let's say, 5% for speculation. But the key is this, don't hire an expert. For example, we've been conditioned, and this is the trap, right? So you're a homeowner, right? So if your pipes in your house burst, you probably do a lot better off calling a plumber to fix your pipes than trying to fix them yourself, right? Right, right fair enough, right? If you have an electric short, I suggest you call an electrician versus trying to go put on rubber gloves and not get electrocuted. You'll get a much better result with the expert in that too. If you're sick, let's say your appendix is about to burst, right? Don't do your own surgery, have your wife cut you open. Go to a doctor that's an expert at doing surgery. Let him do the surgery. Fair. Fair enough, right? That's true for almost all things in life, except Wall Street. It's the one exception to the otherwise pretty much steadfast rule about seeking out experts to help you get the best result. On Wall Street, they don't get you a better result than doing it yourself. They get you a worse result because of all the fees, the commissions, the performance bonuses, and also they can't outguess the market. The market is too hard to beat. Now, you have, again, there's a few people that can do it. They're not taking your money. How? Okay, I want to focus on them for a second because undoubtedly they're the touts. They're the, they're the people who convince everyone. the rest of us that this works right. because they're so rich. How do they get, how did those people get rich? So if you look a guy like, you know, for example, like a Ray Dalio, who's yeah. been a he got in very early into the game. Right. And he's an incredibly brilliant guy. He's a great stock picker and whatever his proprietary method is or a Warren Buffett. Right. You know, these, there's a few people out there. And this is what, one of the great studies was from an economist named Paul Samuelson. Right. In the 70s. And this is really what started the shift into index funds. He did a study that went back 100 years all the way to the earliest days of record keeping, right? I study every mutual fund out there since the 1920s, all the stock recommendations since the 1890s, right? And he came to the conclusion, he goes, okay, maybe there were a few people who can outperform the S&P, but they remain more, remarkably well hidden. He couldn't find any. <laughs> couldn't find, this is like a top, like he won a Nobel Prize, the guy for this, right? So that was really the beginning. That was like the shot across the bow. Now, Wall Street did everything they could to suppress this. So the first guy to try this was, was uh, Jack Bogle from Vanguard. Yeah. You know, Vanguard, right? So Vanguard's a place, a great, great place where you could buy the best index funds with virtually no expenses. So I strongly recommend Vanguard, right? And there's a few others as well, but Jack Bogle was the first, right? But when he started Vanguard, Wall Street went out on the ultimate smear campaign for like a decade suppressing everything about index funds, saying it's the stupidest thing. Who wants to be average? Dreyfus, which is a huge mutual fund company, said, no fees, no way. Like actually in public, in the Wall Street Journal, full page, it's like, if you don't, like no, to, that was marketed to the people who were the gatekeepers to investors. So yeah. if they're not, because Vanguard doesn't pay fees, right? So if they won't pay you fees, don't put your clients in their funds. Instead, put them in our high commission funds, we'll pay you a lot of money. So for many, many years, Vanguard languished and was suppressed, right? It finally got traction after the crash in 87 for the first time, all of a sudden, you know, the mirage evaporated when everyone lost a lot of money. And for the first time, Vanguard started to get a fair shake in the market. And then slowly but surely, they started to grow and grow. And then as the internet 
came about and the high-speed connections and platforms for direct communications with the customers, it suddenly became a mass exodus out of this, like, you know, sort of high expense mutual funds, right? Which I think that and Bogle saved the public probably a few hundred billion by now in fees. Mutual funds were ripping people's eyeballs out forever. Now they still do crappy. Their performance is crappy compared to the S&P 500, but for years and years, they're just ripping the public's eyeballs. That was the most lucrative industry out there. And Wall Street just spent, you know, countless hundreds of millions on advertising campaigns and whatnot, right, to make people think this is the way to go. When you hear people say the news is full of lies. Some Kennedy's motorcade. 239 people. The death of Jeffrey Epstein.